Ejohu Gibor, who is mighty? Really, no one ever learned this praise? Mishnah study, Pirkei Avot. Who is mighty? Ejohu Gibor. I thought this was a very famous phrase. Now that's who's rich. The one who conquers their anger. The one who conquers their anger. This is the famous expression in Perkei Avot of who is the one that is mighty, the one who overcomes their anger, their inclination, all of the, uh, the negative emotions, if we want to get into more uh, modern psychological terminology. You are in control. That is what makes you mighty. As opposed to who? What would be the, uh, the normal definition of who is mighty? A warrior, a king, right? Rambo, uh, that, that's mighty, right? Uh, Iron Man, that's, that's mighty. I mean, literally, it's called the Mighty Avengers. I mean, that's mighty. And in case you're thinking that's a, a modern definition and that we have always found throughout all the biblical literature a high-minded definition of what might should be, who is the first person given the title of Gibor in the entire Tanakh? I'll give you a hint, it's from this week's Torah portion, but it's not from its namesake. <laughs> so it's not Noah, you can scratch him off the list. Nimrod, Nimrod, right? He is the Gibor, the first mighty man that we see in all of Torah. Now, a lot of you probably don't know the name Nimrod, or if you do, you think of it as being some uh, mid 20th century insult, what a Nimrod. Um, but this is a biblical name, um, and he figures quite uh, prominently there in the, uh, the chapters just after the flood, uh, just after the problem with Noah and his son. And what is he famous for? How, what makes him mighty according to the text? Uh, or does anyone actually know this text apart from just me and uh, uh, Avraham over here in the corner? <laughs> He did not step into thing. You're thinking of Nachshon. Oh, that's later on in the story of, uh, of Exodus. No. He is not a smith. He is a hunter. Nimrod the mighty. Nimrod the mighty hunter. He is a hunter. Now, you might be thinking, oh, come on. I mean, is that like such a big deal? Well, until very recently, being a, a powerful, mighty hunter was absolutely a big deal. In the days before being able to bring down an elephant with a, uh, a, a, a piece of metal that you bought at Walmart, the only way that you could hunt large animals was through rather audacious self-sacrifice. Uh, you had to get out there with your uh, spear and try and stop the bear before the bear killed you. And, and honestly, even with the spear, the odds are on the bear. Uh, they are rather terrifically ferocious beasts, as were the lions and the panthers and the jaguars and even the non-predatory uh, beasts of burden, well, that eventually became domesticated, were kind of the thing that could mess you up. How many people here would like to go bare-fisted for a few rounds with a bull? I don't see that many people jumping in. There's a reason why bullfighting is considered to be a dangerous activity. Because uh, really, the bull has the odds here, uh, although unfortunately, the way they handle it is a whole nother issue. But Nimrod is this first mighty man, this Gibor. He is a hunter, but that is not the only claim to fame that he has. It's not just that he was this amazingly uh, capable hunter able to go against the most ferocious beasts of the age, which would have been very helpful for the community, not just for providing food, but providing safety. Remember that until very recently, wild animals were considered an active threat in most parts of the world. Nimrod is also known as being the first one to set up a malchut, to become a melech, to become king. He is the first real king that we see in the line that began with Adam. Now, this is not coincidental. Uh, the, the fact that he is known as both a mighty hunter as well as the first king, establishing the first kingdom, 
These are not like two random hobbies that he happened to have, like uh, stamp collecting and fly fishing. These actually are uh, linked together. You have to understand the, uh, the psychology uh, of the, uh, the, the pre-industrial world. Who gets to rule? The strongest. Or more specifically, the one who's good at stabbing other things better than the next guy. That was the definition of who would rule. If you were good at stabbing things, then chances are people would come to the conclusion that when you said you wanted to be in charge, if you said no, you'd stab them. And if this is the kind of guy that can stab down a bear, what chance do you, random farmer, have against him? Not so great. And so, indeed, we find that all of the early forms of, uh, of, of kingship, of, uh, uh, of monarchical rule, of autocracy, where you have one person or a small group at the top, are built around this idea of implied force, or not so implied, and actual use of force. And the skeletal remains that are found through archaeology bear witness to this. The ancient world was an incredibly violent place. Huge percentages, depending upon the different uh, settlements of the bones that have been found, all have evidence of wounds. Not, not just injuries like they might have fallen off a ladder, but actual wounds from, from rocks, from swords, from spears, embedded arrow points still in the body when buried. People were dying from violence a lot. So if you knew that violence was on the cards, and you knew this guy was really good at violence because he was able to tackle the biggest beasts of the time, and he said he wanted to be in charge, you let him be in charge. Because <laughs> the alternative is he's going to stab you. Now, what do we know about his kingdom? Well, precious little in terms of the, the explicit uh, stories of the, the Torah itself. But we get two very important clues. One, the name Nimrod itself is a, a cognate of the Hebrew word for rebelliousness. And if you are king, who are you rebelling against? Because usually it's people rebelling against the king that would be called the rebels. But if you are the king, who's left to rebel against? God. Exactly. And where do we see that rebellion? Well, in the resumption of the narrative after Nimrod comes onto the stage, uh, after we get through a little bit of the begat begats, we get the story of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, depending upon your pronunciation preference. And this story about the, the, the people coming together to build a giant uh, edifice, the kind of thing kings did, is considered to be a bad thing by the Torah. It's not entirely explicit what exactly is wrong with what they are doing, but the general understanding of the commentaries, and really quite uh, implicit within the text, is that they were building something to rival God. Either they were building a tower in order to assault God, which was one interpretation, meaning we're going to build a, a tower and then we'll send the army up and it'll be able to storm heaven. A little bit of a simplistic thinking about where heaven was located. Or, and this is something that is borne out throughout the Middle East, they were building a tower as a form of monument building that could rival God. The ziggurats of the Middle East, the pyramids of the Middle East, these were literally man-made mountains to show man could make a mountain too. And therefore, man was on the level of God. You see how that logic works? Right? If I am able to build a mountain, then I am able to create something that you thought only gods could create. Therefore, I am equal to God, if not another type of God, and I should be worshipped, or at the very least followed. And reminder, if you don't really like that idea, I can still stab you. This seems to be the result of Nimrod's malchut, of his uh, uh, sovereignty being established. And indeed, it seems to be the result of every kingdom being established. I, I know that we are uh, ecstatic and talk so much about the reestablishment of the kingdom of David, but there's a reason why we say the kingdom of David and don't really mention any of the other Jewish kings. It's not just because of the, uh, the implication of messianic redemption, it's because, by and large, all the other Jewish kings were terrible. <laughs> they were rats. Uh, some of them were merely weak and went along with the idolatry and immorality of their age. Others 
put their foot down on the accelerator and drove that process forward faster than the people themselves would have even imagined. But by and large, they were all rubbish. They were all terrible. Why did they get to continue to be king? Because they were good at stabbing people who said they shouldn't be king. Their, con their continued ruler, rule, rule, rulership, their continued uh, sovereignty was established upon violence and the threat of violence. And when someone actually came along better at stabbing things, then they stopped being king, which happened regularly in the northern kingdom. And there were a couple attempted coups against David in the southern kingdom. And it all came down in the end to stabbing. So what's the alternative? Within the Jewish context, we can see that our own kings generally uh, are, are terrible. And those are people who were raised with the benefit of Judaism, raised with the benefit of the Torah, raised with the example of what a king should be, subservient to God and a servant to God in order to try and care for the people and raise them towards God through the gift of Torah in order to benefit everybody in the kingdom. And even with that as being the mission statement over the throne, they were still terrible autocrats. And the people outside of Jewish history, when we look at the kings throughout the rest of the world, we don't see so many good ones there either. So what's the alternative? Because, you know, there are people out there who are good at stabbing. And they tend to want to be in charge and think they deserve to be in charge because of their stabbing skills. And tend to think that they deserve a greater share because of their stabbing skills. So what do we do? We just, the best stabber wins? <laughs> we have other forms of government. We don't have other forms of government. We have the oldest form of government. What is the oldest form of government? Democracy. It's the oldest form of government is democracy. You have to have democracy first before someone else can take it away by threatening to stab you if you don't do what they say. You don't start with one person saying, all right, this is my country. If you want to step in, you have to let me be in charge. You start off by everybody being together, and then one person getting really good at stabbing and saying, you know what, from now on, rather than deciding things collectively based upon what we all think would work, how about if you do what I say? And if you object, how about if I stab you? And people going, well, you know, he is a gibor. <laughs> he is pretty mighty. Uh, and did you see what he did to that mammoth? Uh, maybe we should do what he says. Democracy is the original condition for humanity. And throughout the text of the Torah, it seems to be the default position for our people. Yes, there is an implied idea that one day there might be a king near the, uh, the middle of Deuteronomy. But by and large, we are a tribal structure, which is governed by the people whom the tribe chooses to lead them who will work together as a confederacy of tribes to come up with the best plans. And if the people start making mistakes, the other people step in to try and override that. And this is very much a, a system that we see unfold until the establishment of the monarchy. And with the establishment of the monarchy, then it becomes a constant struggle between kings who think that they get to be king because their dad was king versus the people who think maybe the king isn't doing what God wants them to do, and who cares who your dad was? And the king continuing to rely upon force or the threat of force in order to remain in power. Throughout the rest of Jewish history, from the fall of the, the Jewish kingdoms, after the Romans conquered us and on into the modern world, what has been the operative uh, form of Jewish community life? Democracy. If you lived in a Jewish village, whether it was in Tunisia, or whether it was in Yemen, or whether it was in Poland, your village was run, by and large, by a form of soft democracy. No, people didn't get together and have election days, and, and didn't have campaign ads, thank God for them, and didn't uh, have all of the rigmarole of a, a fully established democratic process. But absolutely, the people who ended up being in charge were generally the people that the community respected and considered to be in good, stand, good, good, good hands if they were the ones who were deliberating. And if people didn't like what they did, didn't like what they said, they got rid of them. Even your rabbis for the last 2,000 years have always been tolerated by the community. 
maybe not an, a yearly election, and I'm glad I don't have to campaign every year, but nevertheless, there is always the implied feeling that the congregation, the community, can tell the rabbi to take a hike. And indeed, throughout our records of history over the last 2,000 years, communities tell rabbis to take the hike fairly often. When the rabbis breach some norm of the community, or if the community realizes that the, um, the rabbi is not qualified for the position that they hold within that community. Democracy is the natural state of humanity. It is the natural state of Judaism. From time to time, we needed a more rapid deployment of force during moments of stress and war. And yes, we would have war chieftains and eventually even kings during the, the time of the Philistine troubles. But the natural place to which we always seek to return is one where all of us recognize that we are equal princes and prince, princesses of the same true king of Adonai, and that we don't need someone to stand at the front of the group. We just need to stand together as a group. Which leads me to the ultimate conclusion that we can see from Nimrod's rise in fame as a hunter and eventually as a, a dictator, and there's much more about him in the Midrash in that respect, as being a tormentor of Abraham as well. The ultimate conclusion we can draw from all of this is vote. Shabbat Shalom.